Oh my gosh, guys, look at this. Can you believe that yesterday was Halloween and we already have snow? Like, what is this? I know this is normally normal, but in the years past, we usually don't have snow yet. That being said, now is not the time that we want to be cracking into our beehives um, because we don't want to break that winter seal that they have. So I figured I would show you guys around down here in the cellar and tell you a little bit about winemaking. So come on. So we don't have a whole lot going on down here today as we're finally nearing the end of our harvest season. Um, it went by crazy, crazy fast this year. It started late, but because of that, it seemed to be like literally only like four weeks long and then it was over. So we only have four more grape varieties to press and then we can put our press away. So we have some Cab Sauv looking all nice and pretty. Um, and then we also have some cab franc. I'm going to be adding yeast to these today, but in order for them to even get to the point that they look like this, it's got its little head in the grapes. Let's go back to the very beginning and trace those grapes right to the vine. And yes, these are honeybees on the grapes, which finally solidifies my theory that the bees actually do collect sugars from fruits, guys. Isn't that insane? But once the grapes have reached full maturity, we pick them and put them in these crates. Luckily, the winery that I work at only has a couple acres of grapes, so it wasn't too bad, but there are many other vineyards that they have to machine pick because there are so many grapes. And don't mind me, I just had to show off these beautifully majestic Chamberson clusters and, oh, you know, always finding four-leaf clovers. <laughs> Now let's go on to step number two. So next on the line is crushing the grapes. They usually come in these totes, um, or I guess you would call them a box. We get most of our grapes from the west side of Michigan. Um, that is a really hardy place to grow grapes and is actually where I'm from. So I'm pretty familiar with the area. But anyways, so the reason we're crushing these grapes is we have to release the juices from the skin. So when we split them open, it makes it so those juices are released and we can either then press them or since this is a red variety, we're going to be fermenting them on the skins so that we get that red color in the wine. So we're smart now and have a forklift and... A little device on the top that or on the uh, lift itself that allows us to be able to um, rotate the box like we are here so that I can then just use this handy dandy tool and just scrape them right on into the crush. Um, in years past we have always just bucketed all the grapes into the crusher which can be very tiring and can be a lot of work. Um, so this definitely is our saving grace. This thing taking a movie of us? Are you taking a video? Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> which we then put into this. This is our juice press. Um, it's all nice and pretty and red at the moment because I have to clean it, so that will be my task today. Um, but there is a, I don't know what to call it. It's like a, um, like a thick piece of material that then um, expands and contracts. It's like a balloon, I guess you would call it. And it presses on the grapes, which causes them to then drip down here into a pan And it'll go through three cycles of this, each one um, then spinning around a couple times to kind of like shift all the grapes and move them around and then recompressing again to try to get as much as they can out of them until they eventually look like this. Now there is snow on top of these. We just did these yesterday because we had a pressing day, but see how they're like super dry now? That is our goal and they kind of look like raisins, but there's nothing left in these babies, so definitely not raisins. <laughs> so remember, I mentioned before that for red wines, we always ferment on the skin so that we get the color. Well, 
this is a rosé right here. So typically whenever we crush red grapes, we would not press them right away. We would then start the fermentation with them. And once they're done with their fermentation, then we press them. But when we're trying to get a rosé, we don't keep them on the skins at all. So we'll send the red grapes through the crush and straight into the press so that we get all of that juice to then ferment. And one of the biggest problems in winemaking is being able to maintain the temperature of your active fermentations because as they're going, they could react with different things that are in the wine, causing it to kick off different things like hydrogen sulfide and create more heat. So we have a cold room, which is seriously a game changer to winemaking. It helps us to control that temperature a little bit better. Um, especially since some yeast strains, they're only tolerant between different certain temperatures. Hopefully you can hear me. <laughs> so yeah. So what I'm doing here is called punch down and all I'm doing is using this nifty little tool here and pushing any of the liquid and skins down to the bottom and then circulating the ones on the bottom back to the top. And the reason why this is super important is mold could possibly collect on the skins when it sits for too long. So it's always a good idea to constantly keep them moist and keep them rotated, especially once the fermentation starts. These have not started yet, so I'm currently doing it just to kind of mix it up a little bit because I have to check the temperature and make sure that it's good at, that it's warm enough for me to add the yeast today. Otherwise, it could potentially kill the yeast. And when I first started, I did not wear gloves and was just like, you know, I'm going to dig my hands in. Who cares if they turn purple and all gross? But I learned the hard way that when you're in contact with a lot of grapes, it's acidic and it eats away your cuticles. So now I wear gloves so I don't have the dreaded purple hands that usually people that work with wine have. <laughs> So now you're probably wondering, okay, Em, so we see that you crush them and then you press them and you make sure you punch them down and also be aware of the different temperatures, but how do the grapes even make alcohol to begin with? So that is what our best friend yeast does. It When we add the yeast to our, um, our grape musk, then the yeast will then start eating away at all of the sugars in that grape solution and then turn it into alcohol. So what I'm doing here is I'm checking what's called the bricks, also known as the sugar content, to see where it's at. We generally use this as a way of telling us how far along the fermentation is. Um, the lower that number gets, the closer it is to being done. And once there are absolutely no more sugars left in that solution whatsoever, then it is ready to then be racked and go into the next set of processes. Now to all of my beekeepers, I'm sure you've probably seen this device before because we also use this in beekeeping to check the moisture level. But here's how it works with wine. So this is called a refractometer. We use this to check for bricks, AKA sugar content. Um, the sugar content will pretty much tell us how much alcohol is going to be produced. So it's really important and it shows us how far along our fermentations are going. Um, this is just a basic one. You put some, some of the liquid on here, put this on there and then look through this. Um, probably can't see it through the camera, but it shows you, or you can kind of see it. Um, it'll show you kind of like, oh yeah, look at that. Yeah, I'll show you kind of like a chart so you can tell what the sugar level is. Now, the cool thing about wine is it is very similar to beekeeping in that there is so much knowledge behind wine and so much history. It is insane. They actually have classes and courses um, that teach people about wine and how to make wine and whatnot. Um, but also it's super scientific, just like beekeeping. So that's probably why I've latched onto it so much. Um, it is literally like doing one giant chemistry experiment when you're making each, uh, different batch of wine. Um, 
but yeah thank you for following along today i hope that you learned a lot about wine and that you hopefully look at your next bottle or glass of wine a little bit differently um and see all of the hard work and brains that really go behind making the wine to what you are then drinking so if you're ever in the area feel free to come on out to sandhill crane vineyards and come and say hi have a glass of wine with me and see what we're all about um I absolutely love it there and I'm going to be there for quite a while as like I've said before turns out winemaking is definitely one of my other passions but yeah I hope you're keeping warm and I hope your hives are doing great and trust me don't crack them open you don't need to they're doing everything they're supposed to just leave them be until December that's when I'm gonna be putting sugar on them um so yeah I'll see you guys soon and don't quit and be fit